We're going behind the scenes with actor Rob Steinberg, who has a pivotal role in the critically acclaimed movie 12 Years a Slave. It's based on a true story of Solomon Northup. Is that that's the character, main character's name, correct? Yes. He was a, um, uh, a free black man living in Saratoga, New York, uh, you know, turn of the century, 1830s, 1840s. And he was a cart driver as well as a fiddle player. Had a family, wife and kids, and um, lived free in the North, as most blacks did. His family goes off on a little journey. They go for a work. His wife is working and visiting her parents. And when that occurs, he's introduced to a couple of people, characters, who offer him a job to play fiddle in a traveling circus. And uh, they take him on a journey from Saratoga through New York and down to Washington, D.C., where he winds up being drugged and kidnapped and shackled to floorboards when he wakes up in the morning. Mm. Your character's name is? Cephas Parker. Okay, and why are you so vital to the film? Both, both as an actor, we'll get to as a second, but as, as in the role. Well, Cephas Parker is actually a store owner in New York. He owns a store called Parker's. It's a general goods store. Uh, you can buy food, fabric, clothing, and other miscellaneous items. And in the beginning of the film, we get to see Solomon and his family come into, into Cephas' store and uh, the relationship between uh, Mr. Parker and Mr. Northam. And it's a good one. It's not you know, one of uh, any prejudice or any hint of anything other than equality. What's it like to be in a movie that gets talked about so much. Well, there's there's some danger in over hyping a movie and talking about it in terms as some critics have, uh, and saying this is a shoe in for a nomination and all the you know in all the major categories and so and so should win an Oscar and this could be the first year that a black director will win an Oscar and that's all great and that feels amazing, but the danger in that is that the expectations then become too high, and um, and by virtue of that. People may say, okay, well, uh, you know, it wasn't as amazing as everybody said, but the truth is it's an important film, and I think we start from the place where we say it's history. No one has really done uh, a film like this, ever. I mean, we've had Roots, but that was a TV series back in the 70s. We had um, Amistad, which was another great film that showed the brutality of slavery, but nothing quite like this, and from one man's journey, from somebody who actually went through it, this is uh, his narrative. This is experience that he went through as a free man living in the North, then sold into slavery in the South. Now, you're talking about, you talked about the director, that's Steve McQueen. Um, a lot of big names associated with this film. You want to run, run through, I mean, along with the name Rob Steinberg, there's a lot of other big names in well, this film. Well, the bigger, the bigger name would be Robert Martin Steinberg, but apparently they took out a few letters and just knocked it down to Rob Steinberg. <laughs> Um, Brad produced the film and his company, Plan B, um, was very involved in making this film happen. And I think Brad said, you know, if I play a small part in this, maybe they'll get some more attention. So um, he plays a Canadian liberal carpenter who's sort of traveling through the South doing some repairs and doing some building on various plantations. And he meets Solomon Northup kind of late in the film and um, agrees to help him out of his predicament by sending letters to his family and friends in the North, and I being one of the recipients of the letter. Chiwetel Ejiofor, a name that doesn't really flow off the tongue easily, but you will recognize him. You've seen him in other films. He's a tremendous actor, and he plays the role of Solomon. And he is in nearly every scene in the movie, maybe 162 of the 164 scenes. Um, also in the cast, uh, Michael Fassbender plays plantation owner Epps, who is really evil, just a mean, nasty, terrible person. Uh, but yet Michael brings a little slice of humanity to this guy that you can maybe get a, glinner, a glimmer of a, a identification with. Um, Alfred Woodard has a small part. Benedict Cumberbatch, Paul Dano, Paul Giamatti, uh, Scooch McNary, Ian Killam from Saturday Night Live. Um, and in a supporting role playing Patsy, the slave, is uh, Lupita Nyong'o. And uh, she was sort of plucked out of Yale Drama School and is going to be a name that's going to be heard uh, quite a lot in the future. How do you get the character? How do you figure it out? 
Well, you, you look at a guy who is going to ultimately leave his, you know, my character, Cephas Parker. Mr. Parker is going to leave the North and leave Saratoga and travel all the way down to Louisiana in 1853. What does that take? You know, rail, carriage, uh, and then you're probably going to be in New York and take a ship down around the tip of Florida. It's going to take four to five weeks to make this journey. It's not an easy journey. So I have to think about what my character, you know, what kind of person this character was. You know, how great was he to make these sacrifices and, and do this for his friend and his fellow man? And I was trying to find places in my life where I could, you know, have I done that for somebody? Have I ever done that? Have I ever made that kind of sacrifice? And, and I was struggling until I realized that the word isn't sacrifice. Uh, I had a friend, one of my best friends, who was dying of a very rare blood disease. And as soon as I heard that he had little time left, I rushed across the country and, and sat by his side and spent time with his family and his children and did what I could. And that never looked like a sacrifice. It wasn't a sacrifice. It was doing the right thing. It was doing something out of love, something out of compassion. And when you do it for those reasons, it's not a sacrifice. And then I found Cephas Parker. What's it like to work on a movie that probably has a higher purpose, that probably is, is an important film for people to see and to be part of? The movie shot for about six weeks. I shot for four days. So in my limited amount of time on set, especially when you're you know, on a plantation, and you look around and the background actors are dressed as slaves and with ragged clothing, standing by their sheds and their huts where they lived, it was, um, it was intense. I mean, it, you know, it was not light and easy on set. You know, the words that are being used to, you know, the way they treat the slaves, the way the slave masters and the plantation owners treat the slaves is as property, as lower than dogs. And so you get that overpowering sense when you step onto a plantation that there's a connection back to those horrible days. And even the crew... You know, as they're standing around in the hot, hot sun, and I'm wearing wool and gabardine and 102. I mean, and it becomes a little overwhelming. You know that you're there for a, a higher purpose. You know you're there to do something that hopefully is really important. So the audience is going to see something that they've read about, see something that they've heard about, you know, but they've never seen it quite like this. Uh, from the beautiful vistas and scenery of Louisiana, the weeping willows, the Spanish moss going over the trees, the beautiful skies as the clouds roll in, the uh, cotton fields. You know, there's some stunning visuals, and the cinematographer, Sean Bobbitt, is just remarkable. He's done Steve's other two films, and he's, he's just really beautiful in, in, in landscaping the picture. Now, you've been on a bit of a roll lately. This isn't your only film in theaters. Currently, uh, and hopefully still in theaters this week, is Grace Unplugged, um, and that's a story about a, a young girl who's a singer, and to feel a little constrained by the limitations her father puts on her. Uh, he's a pastor who also plays music in his church, and, and, the, and, the, and the young girl sings with him. But she sort of wants to branch out on her own. So she goes out to Los Angeles to try to find her own way there. And I play a record company president that, that signs her. I am not an evil man. I am a good man. The movie is filled with, uh, for the most part, good imagery and good people. But... Like anything, there are temptations, and sometimes people stray. And uh, what her lesson is, ultimately, is that she doesn't want to be in an environment where those temptations take away her soul and take away who she is. So she winds up uh, with my blessing as the record company president, uh, with a label deal and a faith-based record deal. Goes back to Alabama to her father's congregation and sings with him and sings solo. You also have a, a recurring part in Treme, which is shot in Louisiana. True. Uh, although recurring is a loose term, meaning more than one. And uh, I have two. Two. Uh, two, two shows. Uh, I did the opening of uh, last season, season three, uh, on Treme. And I play the... All right, do you remember Terry the Cop? Terry the Cop's ex-wife's new husband. David the Morris is Terry the Cop. Yes, right. and uh, his ex-wife is Laura Cayuette, a fine actress and a good friend for many years. Um, and Laura, Laura's actually playing, uh, she plays in Django and Chain, Leo, uh, Leo DiCaprio's uh, sister, if, you, if, if we're trying to jog our memory. But on Treme, um, I'm in Indianapolis, where um, 
Terry's ex-wife has moved with her two boys. And they're now part of my family. So Terry comes to visit. And I will reprise that same Indianapolis, Midwestern, sweater-wearing, tweed jacket guy uh, in, in episode three, which will premiere at some point in December. Oh. All right, well, mention some of your other roles that you've had over the year. I mean, I know, uh, you know, there's some big ones. Give me a quick summary of where have you, you know, some of the things you've done. Um, I started in New York in the early 80s working with the Scorpions, a heavy metal band out of Germany. I also did some work with Bob Marley's estate, with Rita Marley and Ziggy Marley. Um, my father was Bob's attorney back in the 70s, and I had a great opportunity to meet him early on in my life, and that's certainly a big highlight. And I thought I'd be in the music business forever, but I decided to try something different, something new. And uh, I started acting at the age of 30, moved to Los Angeles, and very quickly got a part in Die Hard 2, which was, uh, at the time, the biggest budget movie ever made at its moment. And people were in great anticipation of how that movie would be so magnificent. It may not have been quite as good as the first one, but uh, it certainly good. put me up on the big screen for the first time, and all of my friends and people who knew me, um, you know, had a chance to see. I remember John Bon Jovi walks up. To me. The Bon Jovi opened up for the Scorpions at the beginning of their career. John walks up to me at a, at a bar in L.A. and said, "I'm sitting here in the movie theater in New Jersey with my wife, Dot, and all of a sudden, in the middle of Die Hard, you come up on the screen, and I'm like, I know him. I know that guy." And it was a great compliment. I mean, certainly That's everybody knows cool. who John Bon Jovi is, and uh, only John Bon Jovi knows who I am. Wow. That's good. That's big. Yeah. So that single white female on Lawful Entry, a part on Matlock, Melrose Place, 90210. Um, I wound up recently moving to New Orleans about four years ago, and within that short period of time, got more work than I did in the previous 10 years in Los Angeles. So I've done some of the things I've done, a couple of parts on a couple of episodes of uh, Army Wives. And then I did a movie called No One Lives. Guess what happens to me? Um, I think it's in the title. Yeah, yeah. It was a very bloody, horrible ending to me and my family. Coming out in theaters in the next month is uh, a parody of The Hunger Games called The Starving Games. Brought to you from the guys who brought you a date movie and scary movie and, wow. and the parodies. Okay. parodies. Okay. And I play Gandalf the Wizard. All right, Rob Steinberg. See him now in 12 Years a Slave, in Grace Unplugged, 12 Years a Slave. Uh, what's the other the takeoff movie? Starving Games. Starving The Starving Games and Treme. That's, that's pretty good. That's four things right there. Congratulations. <laughs> Thank you. Great talking. Thanks. Nice talking to you, Mark.